This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, Merry Christmas, Tampa Bay. And uh, welcome to your source for all the news about worms and germs. My name is Robert, and I appreciate you listening on this uh, Christmas Eve. The website is OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. And I encourage you to check it out for news from around the globe and right here in your own backyard. Well, mumps is not something that we really talk a lot about when we're talking about the state of Florida. Why? Because, I don't know, we see about, I don't know, enough mumps cases that would fill up a hand on an annual basis. But however, the Florida Department of Health has reported 56 cases this year uh, through mid-December. And uh, this has really prompted them to reach out to providers uh, to ensure that they are they understand how to collect samples for um, laboratory analysis, uh, make sure they understand vaccine requirements, and to you know to educate the population. Now, while the cases have been seen throughout the state, certain counties uh, account for the bulk of the cases. And one of them includes Hillsborough County. Um, so far, the preliminary data show that among all the cases, about 50% have a documented history of MMR vaccination. And some small mumps outbreaks have been investigated in households and among high school students and their contacts. And of course, the CDC recommends that children do get two doses of MMR vaccine starting with the first dose at 12 through 15 months of age and the second dose at four through six years of age. Um, so anyway, um, right now, you know, Florida is still small potatoes compared to some states. If you look at Texas or Arkansas or some of those, New York, um, where, where they're seeing hundreds and hundreds of cases and nationally, um, through the first 11 months of the year, the U.S. has reported nearly 5,000 cases a month. Uh, let me get in a word from my sponsor. Uh, for many years, we've been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or email at info at glymedx.com. All right, well, the efficacy and the accepted regimen of antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease has been a point of real contention among physicians and organizations and patients. Well, now there's a new study that finds that the Lyme bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, survive a 28-day course of antibiotics months after infection. Now, joining me now to discuss this incredible research is lead author Monica Embers, Ph.D. Dr. Embers is with the Tulane University School of Medicine, and she's an advisor for Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Dr. Embers, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you. Now, you've had two papers published um, basically at the same time in PLOS One and the American Journal of Pathology, which I will link to in the show notes for the podcast. Um, Recently, which they looked at the persistence of uh, Borrelia burgdorferi spirochetes after antibiotic treatment. Uh, Dr. Embers, before we get into the meat of the research, which is incredibly interesting, um, can you explain why this study is important? Certainly. Um, Over the years, we've begun to realize that a number of patients 
are continuing to have symptoms after they're treated with the re- recommended courses of antibiotics. And so this is commonly uh, denoted as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And our goal really is to try to understand post-treatment Lyme syndrome and to identify the causative factors so that we can improve treatment. Now, the research itself, I, I read both reports, and it was really quite involved um, from treating with antibiotics to xenodiagnosis. Um, and I really want to give you the floor here, Dr. Embers. Uh, can you discuss the research methods that I believe listeners will find quite fascinating? Sure. Um, importantly, we use the um, rhesus macaque model of Lyme disease because it most closely mimics human disease. So they experience the same things that humans would experience in Lyme disease. And we also try to get as as close as possible to um, mimicking the human infection by inoculating these animals with ticks. So we we, um, have infected ticks, we feed them on the monkeys, and then um, let, let the infection progress and then after a period of time, we give them, in this case, it was four months, give them 28 days of doxycycline and then let them, let the infection progress if it was still persistent over a period of 12 months. Mm-hmm. And then um, we looked to try to identify persistent bacteria, spirochete bacteria in these monkeys. And because it's so difficult to try to culture Borrelia from infected patients, um, we use a technique called xenodiagnosis. And this is a technique where you feed uninfected ticks on the animals, and those ticks will take up the bacteria that are otherwise hard to find or culture. And so that's, that was sort of the key in us being able to identify that intact, persistent spirochete bacteria were lingering in those subjects. Right, and... and you had some very, very important findings ranging from post-treatment infection, viable bacterium found in different organs, and uh, issues with the bullseye rash. Um, Dr. Ambers, can you spend some time on discussing you know, some of these very important findings? Certainly. Uh, we also looked at the immune responses. So right. we looked at the antibody responses and how, the, how, how well those reflected the infectious uh, process and the infection status. And so we saw tremendous variability in the immune response. We also saw variability in those monkeys that um, did or did not develop the bullseye rash. Um, and we also saw differences in... Uh, um, how they responded to infection. Some, some had a rash, some, some had persistent spirochetes in the heart, some in the nervous tissues, some in the joints. Um, and it was really, um, it's really good to use this model because we know that every difference we're seeing is the host. So it's a host-dependent difference because we're using the same strain of bacteria to infect these uh, subjects. Now, how is this research important concerning what we consider traditional diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease, you know, the day-to-day physician treating a patient? How is this research going to affect that in your, in your view? So there has been contention um, over, over many years about the guidelines for antibiotic treatment of Lyme disease. There are two different schools of thought, and um, our research pertains specifically to Uh, patients who have a disseminated infection, one in which they have gone undiagnosed for a period of time and then they're given the recommended treatment. So I think in terms of um, how physicians look at this and think about treating their patients, it's important to recognize that treating with doxycycline for 28 days in in a patient who has been infected for a while may not be efficacious. So I think it's time to, to look at the guidelines again and come up with some better, some better options. Right. So, Dr. Embers, so what's next? Do you have some follow-up research planned, or what do you plan on go- going with this? Absolutely. Our, our research now is really focused on finding better treatment options for patients. 
So we're testing uh, new therapeutics. We're testing different combinations of antibiotics. And, you know, we have these model systems that we can use to evaluate uh, therapeutics. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to use those in humans one day. Yeah, it was very fascinating stuff, and I encourage people to check it out. I will, like I said, post in the show notes the two studies and the press release, and you can check it out for yourself. And it uh, it does clearly seem to support claims of patients that have been uh, describing lingering symptoms uh, that have been shunned in the past. Certainly. We, we, we perform these studies very carefully. Um, we included as many controls as we could possibly think of, and uh, we're very confident in the results. Yes, fascinating stuff. Well, thank you, Dr. Monica Embers, for your time and expertise, and congratulations on this very interesting study. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. All right. Let's um, take a look at something I just something out of the world of weird news. Let me put it that way. And uh, it's Christmas, and... I don't want anybody to burn their house down over the Christmas holiday. But something weird is going on in Cincinnati, Ohio. In the past month, uh, people have tried to kill bed bugs and ended up starting apartments on fire. And um, most recently, I don't know, a week or so ago, there was a fire in, in a part of Cincinnati which caused about $250,000 worth of damage. And what happened was, is a woman on the first floor of the building was trying to kill bed bugs with alcohol near an open flame. And of course, uh, this started a big fire. And you think, okay, well, yeah, uh, isolated incident. Well, no. <laughs> about two weeks before that, a 13-year-old boy in Cincinnati was trying to burn away bed bugs with alcohol and a match. It set his mattress on fire, caused about $300,000 of damage to an apartment complex, displacing eight people. So, yeah, lesson learned here is don't use alcohol near a flame to take care of bed bugs. That's not really the way to do it. And even these aren't the only cases. Uh, there's reports of... Uh, in 2016, uh, a guy in Detroit did the same thing. And in 2013, a New Jersey man burned down his house trying to eradicate bed bugs using a space heater, a hair dryer, and a heat gun. So let's be wise over the holiday season and let's not burn our house down. Okay, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about meningitis. Because meningitis has really been in the news lately. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and start with a clip from the Oregon Health Authority. Go ahead, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Dr. Paul C. Slack. I'm the medical director for communicable diseases and immunizations here at the Oregon Health Authority's Public Health Division. Uh, the news is that we have a sixth case of meningococcal disease uh, in a student at the OSU Corvallis campus. And uh, going back to October of last year, uh, we've had these six cases, which in February we declared constituted an outbreak of meningococcal disease. Uh, this is a serogroup B strain, and the good news is that there is uh, a vaccine against it. And our main message today is to get students and parents, while they're home on Christmas break, uh, to have the students vaccinated, because this is the best way to prevent the disease. Yeah, so this is the sixth... Uh, meningococcal meningitis case on the Corvallis campus at Oregon State University since November of 2016, and the third one since October this year. Um, and basically, OSU is is saying that um, uh, they are going to require all of its Corvallis students, 25 and younger, to be vaccinated for meningococcal B disease by February 15th. But that's, as you heard, the the doctor was saying that, you know, when they're home on Christmas break, get it done then. Um, what I want to share with you now is an interview that I did, I don't know, a week ago maybe, uh, with um, Dr. Leonard Friedland with uh, GlaxoSmithKline. And we, we had a, about a 
a 25, 30 minute discussion on bacterial meningitis and vaccinations. So we're going to go ahead and take a listen to that. And meningitis is an inflammation or a swelling of the protective membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. It can be caused by just about anything. We're talking viruses or bacteria, fungi, and even parasites. Now, bacterial meningitis, in particular, meningococcal meningitis, is very serious and can be deadly. Now, in recent weeks, we've reported on the website on cases on college campuses like Oregon State University and UMass Amherst. So joining me now to discuss bacterial meningitis and the vaccinations is Dr. Leonard Friedland. Dr. Friedland is the Vice President, Director of Scientific Affairs and Public Health, and Vaccines North America at GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Friedland, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much for having me and for taking an interest in this really important topic. Yes, sir, it is important. I agree with you on that. Now, I touched on meningitis in the intro, and I like to focus on bacterial and more specifically meningococcal meningitis and meningococcal mm -hmm. disease. So how common is bacterial meningitis in the United States? Well, let's uh, just start just for a background on, on who I am. So I'm a pediatrician and also a pediatric emergency medicine physician uh, throughout my training, and I'm also a vaccine researcher. So in my clinical care, I've cared for many children and adolescents and adults with bacterial meningitis. And so I can say firsthand, this is a very serious disease that can be deadly. Now, it's not common, but it's also not rare. Uh, in recent years, there have been approximately 4,100 cases of bacterial meningitis reported each year in the United States and about 500 deaths due to bacterial meningitis in the United States every year. So those are the numbers. It's not common, but it's also not rare. Very serious infection, and it can be deadly. Right. And it's not just in the United States either. This is a worldwide issue in certain places, uh, like parts of Africa. I mean, they have epidemics on an annual basis. Um, You're absolutely right. This is a, gl a global issue. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about global issues as well. I was focusing on the U.S. Right. Because that's where I specifically work. But you're absolutely right. This is an issue all around the world. Now, bacterial meningitis is caused by a number of different bacterial species. Uh, Dr. Friedland, what are the most common uh, bacterial causes of meningitis? Well, there are many bacterial causes of meningitis. Uh, among the most common would be the following bacteria, Streptococcus pneumonia, Group B Streptococcus, Neisseria meningitidis, which you mentioned earlier. Also, Another cause of bacterial meningitis is caused by Haemophilus influenza. And another cause is Listeria monocytogenes. So those are the five most common causes of bacterial meningitis. But also I should mention that the causes of bacterial meningitis are often associated by different age groups. Right. So, for example, in our newborns, our very, very young the common causes of bacterial meningitis there are group B streptococcus, streptococcus pneumonia, Lyseria monocytogenes, and then also Escherichia coli or E. coli. Mm -hmm. As we get into babies and children, the most common causes then are streptococcus pneumonia, Neisseria meningitidis, Haemophilus influenza type B, and also group B streptococcus. And then when we speak about adolescents, and I'm sure we're going to come back to adolescents and young adults in a little bit, there we're looking at mostly Neisseria meningitidis and Streptococcus pneumonia. And we also have to remember the older people in our population, particularly um, the elderly population, who are at risk for Streptococcus pneumonia meningitis, Neisseria meningitidis, Haemophilus influenza type B, Group B Streptococcus, and also Listeria monocytogenes. So those are the common types and also how they break down by age. Okay, good. Now, uh, let's focus on the most serious. I, I think you'll agree with me that meningococcal meningitis is the most serious. Um, 
How does someone contract this very serious and potentially deadly bacterial infection? Yes. Now, all cases of bacterial meningitis can be very, very serious and can be deadly. And the risk factors for acquiring uh, this illness are the following. Uh, One risk factor is age. We already mentioned the types of bacteria by age. But, for example, our very, very young babies are at increased risk for bacterial meningitis because of their immature immune systems. Our, particularly our older people in our population, our elderly, are at risk for bacterial meningitis due to the age-related decline in immunity that occurs uh, with us as we age. Other people who are at risk for bacterial meningitis are uh, people who are in close contact with other people, so in crowded conditions, uh, people who uh, um, frequent bars or uh, in the military where there are crowded quarters. Close contact uh, is an association for how you can contract this disease. It can be spread from person to person, from nasal and from uh, oropharynx mouth secretions. So close living, uh, kissing, intimate sexual contact can spread uh, these, these bacteria. There are other medical conditions that place people at risk to contract bacterial meningitis, and those are people who are immunosuppressed, be it from HIV infection or other immunosuppressive conditions or the medications that we're using to treat people who have cancer and other uh, serious illnesses where the medicines we use suppress their immune systems to control their illness. Also, people who don't have a spleen. Spleen is an organ in our body that helps us control certain types of bacterial infections, among other things that the spleen does. If we don't have a spleen, we're at risk for what's called encapsulated bacteria, Haemophilus influenza type B, Streptococcus pneumonia, and Neisseria meningitidis. And why might you not have a spleen? You could be born without a spleen, or you could have an injury to your spleen from a motor vehicle accident or a a motorcycle accident, and the spleen gets injured. Um, And people who uh, don't have a spleen or a spleen that functions, so, for example, also people who have hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia, their spleens can become non-functional over time due to their disease. They're at high risk for bacterial meningitis. Another group that can contract meningitis are people who work with the bacteria in a laboratory. So hospital workers who work with the bacteria in laboratories um, are at risk. And then also people who travel. There are parts of the world where bacterial meningitis is more common. It can be an endemic. Um, there's a, 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 a certain, we call it the uh, sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan meningitis belt in Africa, where there's a very high risk for a type of Neisseria meningitis. And also people who attend um, pilgrimages, for example, the Hajj that occurs every year. Massive number of people, close crowding, meningitis uh, can spread there. So those are among the ways that you can contract this illness um, and get exposed to this bacteria. All right. We're, we're going to go ahead. In the, in the second half, we'll go ahead and listen to the rest of the interview with Dr. Friedland um, as we get up against the, the hard break. Uh, let me go over some quick news. Um, Colorado State University uh, announced that they were treating a dog at their uh, veterinary teaching hospital. And the dog was diagnosed with plague. And uh, they put out notifications uh, throughout the, the campus and, and anybody that would have been uh, in direct contact with this animal or other animals that were being treated. And, uh, and everything was taken care of. They, they did a, a yeoman's job of uh, handling that. And then there's another story about plague, which I thought was kind of interesting, was um, in California... Uh, Two bears that were killed under uh, depredation permits uh, turned out to be positive to antibodies for Yersinia pestis, the cause of plague. And um, apparently the, 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 uh, the bears were culled because of s- stuff they were doing on private property and you know, different damage and all that. But it, at first when I looked at it, I said, oh, this is kind of weird, but it's not uncommon because... Uh, predators like bears often prey on like rodents, which are primary carriers of plague. So this is something that uh, they do see from time to time uh, in the United States. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. And um, all right, up against the break, 
And after the break, we'll continue our discussion with bacterial meningitis and the vaccinations with Dr. Leonard Friedland. I'll see you then. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the program. Uh, Let's go ahead and continue our discussion on bacterial meningitis and the vaccinations with Dr. Leonard Friedland. As part of uh, your statement, you mentioned close quarters and and, and bars and all that. So does that explain why we're seeing it in college-age students? And uh, we're seeing several outbreaks of meningococcal disease in several big cities around the planet in in, um, men who have sex with men population. That would explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's cover both of those. Sure. So um, the bacteria that cause bacterial meningitis, um, as we mentioned, there are many different types. Uh, but when we look particularly at Neisseria meningitidis or Streptococcus pneumonia or Haemophilus influenza, this, these bacteria live in our body. They're um, uh, where they're a host for the bacteria, and it's very common. They and they tend to live in our nose and in the back of our throat, and we carry the bacteria. We become carriers. And it's symbiotic. It doesn't cause any problem. These bacteria need a place to live, and they live in our nose and our throat. And that's how it's spread. It's spread from person to person, from coughing, from sneezing, from sharing secretions, from kissing, from sharing lipstick or sharing a cup. Things of this nature can spread this bacteria from person to person. And so these bacteria, we carry them and we can transfer them. Now, most people who are carriers never get sick. But, it, but we can spread it to other people who could be at risk. And when it spreads, it's spread by person to person. And so people who are around each other are more likely to be exposed. And so that's where the close quarters come in. So people who um, live in military barracks or live in dormitories in schools or frequent bars and clubs. Um, but this is all common. Everybody should be doing this. This is what we do in life. We're around other people. Now, certain groups like to congregate more closely with their, their their friends than others. So, for example, our adolescents and young adults tend to like to be around large groups of, of people their same age. While as we get into our 40s and 50s, we're less likely to go into some of those more crowded situations. Um, so that's some of the association with colleges that the bacteria can be spread because there's a lot of people around each other. Now, when it comes to men who have sex with men, it's not completely understood while men who have sex with men seem to be at higher risk for uh, bacterial meningitis, particularly uh, most recently Neisseria meningitis, bacterial meningitis. Uh, in fact, men who have sex with men are four times more likely to be at risk for bacterial meningitis than men who do not have sex with men. And men who have sex with men who are HIV positive are 10 times more likely to have a case of bacterial meningitis. Why that is, we don't know. People who are HIV positive can be immunosuppressed. uh, And also, there may be more um, frequent intimate sexual contact. But that's all speculation. But nonetheless, uh, those groups are at higher risk for bacterial meningitis. Very good. Now... Dr. Friedland, what are the typical signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis? Well, the typical signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis would be a sudden onset, so something that comes on quickly with high fever, with headaches, and also with a stiff neck. And the reason for the stiff neck is that it means the meningitis means infection of the lining of the spinal cord and of the brain. And your spinal cord goes right through your neck. And so if it's inflamed, uh, you uh, might have a stiff neck because it might be hurt to move your neck because your spinal cord is inflamed. Um, uh, you can also develop nausea and vomiting. Sensitivity to light is, uh, and also mental status changes, confusion as meningitis sets in. 
Uh, it's also important to mention that associated with meningitis can also be sepsis, bacterial blood infection. And in that case, people will develop a low blood pressure, weakness, fainting, high fever, and get uh, sick very, very quickly, often with trouble breathing as well. Now, these signs and symptoms that I've described can come on relatively quickly. Um, sometimes they can develop in as short as just a few hours or perhaps even over a few days. So for people who have something brewing that just doesn't seem right, they should absolutely see their doctor because it could be uh, the beginning of a meningitis. Okay, I, I noticed that you didn't mention the petechial rash. Ah, okay. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so the petechial rash, petechia means uh, bleeding. And so uh, certain types of meningitis, not all, so that's why I didn't mention it, but with Neisseria meningitis meningitis right. in particular, um, people can develop petechiae, which are it's a bleeding into the skin, starts as small little pinpoint dots that look red as is literally bleeding into the skin. And then over a period of hours, that bleeding can become more like big black and blue marks. We call that uh, purpura. And that can be uh, a, a, one of the presenting signs of meningitis. It's not always there. So you can have meningitis without petechiae. But when we see petechiae, we do worry about bacterial meningitis. Sure. Now, of course, with meningitis, a timely diagnosis and perhaps more importantly, a timely treatment is critical. Um, can you elaborate on that? That's absolutely true. This is an infection that's going to come on quickly and can overwhelm the body by causing inflammation around the brain or the spinal cord or causing this uh, blood uh, infection, sepsis, and they can both be there together. And so we want to recognize it quickly and begin antibiotics. This is bacterial meningitis. The bacteria can be treated with antibiotics. Those antibiotics should start as soon as possible so that we can begin to treat the infection, clear the infection from the lining of the brain and the spinal cord, clear the infection from the blood. The way we make the diagnosis is, number one, we have to recognize clinically that the individual is sick and that bacterial meningitis can be one of the causes of what's happening. And then we'll take samples of their blood of, and of their spinal fluid and also often of their urine to see if we can identify the bacteria and then treat it accordingly. Right, and, and, and identifying the bacteria is important because the treatment for each type is a little bit different. Am I right? Right? Or am I correct? That, that, you're absolutely correct. So yeah. when we start, we'll, we'll start with a, a blood test. We'll look at a blood count. Uh, often the blood count will be abnormal in the case of meningitis. We'll, we'll get a sample of the spinal fluid. Uh, if the spinal fluid looks to our eye as cloudy, um, that's a sense uh, that this could be a meningitis. We we'll also then look in the laboratory under the microscope, and then we culture as well uh, to see if we can both grow the, the bacteria and also we'll do rapid assays, for example, preliminary cell reaction assays. And in the meantime, we're starting to treat in, in case it is a bacterial meningitis. And once we can definitively say what it is, then we can refine our antibiotics to the exact antibiotic for that particular bacteria so we can have the most effective treatment possible. But it is important to mention that even despite early recognition and treatment, this disease can be very, very serious and can result in death. And so, for example, with Neisseria meningitis meningitis, the type of meningitis that we've been seeing on college campuses uh, in the last few years and also in men who have sex with men, upwards of one in seven to one in ten uh, can die from that infection. Um, despite um, early diagnosis and treatment. And so it's really important to also look to see how we can prevent these infections and we can prevent these infections um, with vaccination. Right. And you, and you stepped right into my next question. Um, vaccinations are available for several of the species of bacteria that cause meningitis. And I, I'll, just, I'll just give you the floor and then you can go ahead and talk about the vaccinations and prevention. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. 
So when we started our discussion, we talked about uh, the bacteria that cause meningitis, and I mentioned there were a number of different, as you said, species of bacteria, and, and we have groupings based on people's age. If we focus in on uh, pediatrics and adolescents, we have vaccines that can help protect against three of the common causes of bacterial meningitis. We have vaccines to prevent Haemophilus influenza type B, and that vaccine is given to all infants um, at the, starting at two months of age, and is highly effective. The introduction and the use of homophilus influenza type B vaccines have decreased the uh, the number of cases of bacterial meningitis due to homophilus influenza type B and other diseases caused by homophilus influenza type B. Vaccination has reduced that by over 99% in the United States. So we very rarely see. Mm -hmm. bacterial meningitis due to HIB, as it's uh, referred to, because the vaccination is, is, is so effective in very young children. The other, another type is streptococcus pneumonia, uh, which can uh, cause bacterial meningitis in young infants and also can cause serious disease, particularly in older people in our population. And we routinely use streptococcus pneumonia vaccines now uh, for our patients here in the United States starting in infancy, and they're also now also used in uh, pneumococcal so-called vaccines are used in the elderly, and they're very effective in preventing bacterial meningitis. The other type uh, that's uh, common now, and in fact it's the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adolescents and young adults, is caused by Neisseria meningitidis. Now Neisseria meningitidis is a bacteria that um, has a number of different um, subspecies, uh, we call them uh, sero groups, and there are actually five Neisseria meningitis sero groups that um, can cause bacterial meningitis um, here in in our uh, U.S. population, and they go by letter names. There's sero group A, C, W, Y, and B. And since 2005, in the United States, we've had a vaccine to help protect against four of those five sero groups a so-called meningococcal ACWY vaccine. And that vaccine is routinely given and recommended for all adolescents in the United States starting at around age 10, 11. And then a second dose is given of the meningococcal ACWY vaccine at about age 16. And that's been highly effective in helping to prevent cases of bacterial meningitis due to Neisseria meningitidis, serum groups A, C, W, and Y. The other sero group in the Neisseria meningitidis uh, family is called sero group B, as in boy. And this sero group is the sero group that's been causing disease in college campuses over the last few years. So you mentioned some of the schools right now that are having outbreaks. Uh, there are actually uh, three, if not four, university systems right now that are in the midst of a meningococcal B outbreak. And we now have vaccines also to protect against meningococcal sero group B. They became available starting at around 2015 in the United States, and they have a recommendation where they may be used in adolescents and young adults between the ages of 16 and 23, preferably between the ages of 16 and 18. So with two different meningococcal vaccines, one for meningococcal serum groups A, C, W, and Y, and the second vaccine for meningococcal serum group B, we now have vaccines to also help protect against bacterial meningitis due to Neisseria meningitidis. Now, I want to ask you quick, because I remember covering the big Princeton outbreak. I think it was in 2013. And uh, mm -hmm. why, why did meningococcal B, why was that not implemented in the original uh, four zero group uh, vaccine? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question, and it's a scientific reason. Scientifically, the technology behind the meningococcal ACWY vaccines uses a technology called glycoconjugation, where the, the, the sugar capsule of meningococcal serum groups A, C, W, and Y, that, that capsule, that polysaccharide sugar capsule, is joined together with a protein, and then... These four polysaccharide capsules are joined together with each one with a protein, and that is your ACWY vaccine. This, the capsule, the polysaccharide capsule of meningococcal serum group B as in boy, 
the capsule there was in, was not able to be made into a vaccine. The, the capsule for that particular server would be an antigen that would likely not be effective. It has to do with the science and the structure of the capsule. And so we couldn't use the traditional technology, glycoconjugation, for a serum group B. So we needed to discover and develop a new technology. And that technology was not available back in 2005 when the ACWI vaccines became available in the United States. That new technology is called reverse vaccinology, where we use our knowledge of human immunology to help instruct us how to discover uh, new antigens and select those antigens for a vaccine. It's a bioinformatic, big data approach to developing vaccines. It's a, it's a new technology, and it was employed uh, for the use of meningococcal serogroup B vaccines, and it helped discover the new antigens that are in the now two different meningococcal B vaccines uh, in the United States and also in other parts of the world. And those vaccines became available in 2015. Very interesting. Um, Dr. Friedland, you touched on the effectiveness of, of, of the vaccines, and then they all seem to be quite effective. How about the safety? That's always been a, that's always a concern in this country. Right. Well, let's first focus on the effectiveness, and then we'll come to the safety. Sure. Vaccination is our best tool to prevent bacterial meningitis. Uh, and also, as in, in particular here, we're talking now about Neisseria meningitis, the type of bacterial meningitis we've been seeing on college campuses and also in uh, men who have sex with men. And so vaccination is our best tool, and when vaccines are employed, they can be uh, an effective public health tool to keep our, our populations healthy. And uh, parents and adolescents and young adults should absolutely speak to their doctor to ask uh, about the meningococcal vaccinations, to make sure that they're up to date with their ACWI vaccines and to also ask about the new men B vaccines, B as in boy, um, as they can also help protect against what is now the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adolescents and young adults, meningococcal uh, serum group B. Now, along with any vaccine, not only do we look to see how effective the vaccines are, we also always follow how safe they are. And uh, there are excellent very robust safety data systems in place here in the United States and around the world. Right here in the United States, we have the Vaccine Adverse Reporting System, uh, co-administered by the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control. There's a system uh, called the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is a system uh, that is run by the CDC in collaboration with, uh, with centers around the United States that can do real-time vaccine safety analyses. The Food and Drug Administration has a safety system called PRISM. And then all the vaccine manufacturers, including GlaxoSmithKline, where I'm a vaccine research scientist, we have pharmacovigilance systems where we're constantly looking at the safety of our vaccines. And all together, uh, we follow very closely the safety in real time. And if there's any uh, sign that there's something that we need to evaluate further, uh, we do that uh, uh, right away, of course, and we do it in collaboration. We do it in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control, with the Food and Drug Administration, and with the academic scientific community here in the United States and around the world because safety is absolutely paramount with vaccination. And we're always looking to ask ourselves, what is the benefit versus the risk? And in the case of Nyseria meningitis vaccination, the benefit um, outweighs uh, any of the risk that sure. would be seen. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, Dr. Friedland, any final thoughts on bacterial meningitis and or the vaccines? Yes, and thank you for asking. So right now we have two different vaccines to help prevent bacterial meningitis due to Neisseria meningitis. There's the ACWI vaccine and a separate vaccine for Sir Group B. The ACWI vaccines are routinely recommended for all adolescents, and they're widely used around the United States, although there are some pockets in the United States where they're not widely used, and so you should absolutely speak to your doctor to make sure that you're up to date with the ACWI vaccines. We now also have a vaccine for serogroup B, Neisseria meningitis serogroup B as in boys. And this vaccine, there's two of them, um, and they're, they're both licensed for 
adolescents and young adults between the ages of, of 10 and 25, and the Centers for Disease Control recommends that they may be used in people between the ages of 16 and 23, preferably 16 to 18. And so here my suggestion would be that if you're, if you're listening as an adolescent, you're a young adult or a parent, go speak to your doctor and ask, has my child also received the meningococcal seer group B vaccine? Uh, you understand that we now have this available to help protect against bacterial meningitis. And, um, and then discuss that vaccine and then talk about getting your child vaccinated uh, because we now have two different vaccines to help provide protection against meningococcal disease meningitis due to Neisseria meningitis. Well, very good. This is very informative. I want to thank you, Dr. Leonard Friedland, for your time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. You're absolutely welcome, and thank you very much for being interested in this topic and sharing this with your audience. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Now, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at some news from around Let's start with some news right here in the U.S. Uh, the CDC just recently um, issued a travel advisory for people going to England and Greece uh, because of measles outbreaks in both of those countries. So if you plan on uh, traveling to England or Greece, or for that matter, anywhere else in uh, in Europe, because a lot of countries are experiencing outbreaks right now, uh, make sure that you are vaccinated against the measles with the MMR measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Um, The independence of the seas, the Royal Caribbean cruise ship, they had an outbreak. And um, about 332 passengers and crew came down with something that was causing them nausea and vomiting. And, and, uh, well, the CDC's uh, vessel sanitation program finally confirmed that Yes, the cause of this was, in fact, norovirus. No big surprise there, but it was finally confirmed. Sometimes these cruise ship outbreaks are are really never confirmed. Um, It's out there as unknown etiology, but, uh, yeah, this one has been confirmed as norovirus. Pretty nasty stuff. In Kansas, uh, health officials, including the CDC, got involved in this, and they they have linked one person's salmonella infection to the ingestion of rattlesnake pills from Mexico. So the CDC and, and, and state health officials are advising people, you know, talk to your doctor if you're thinking about taking rattlesnake pills. And particularly if you're in a group that salmonella would be devastating, a severe infection like a weakened immune system, are you receiving chemo? Do you have HIV? Pregnant women and young children and, and older adults. So the epidemiologic and the laboratory evidence show that one person in Kansas became sick with a particular strain of salmonella uh, about a week after taking a rattlesnake pill. Uh, rattlesnake pills, if you weren't aware are often marketed as remedies for various conditions such as cancer and HIV. Uh, The pills contain dehydrated rattlesnake meat ground into a powder and put into a pill form. Well, the problem with that is reptiles uh, carry salmonella. We see that in turtles. We see that in in other, uh, other types of reptiles. And that can make you sick. And this is not the first time this has ever happened. There's been other outbreak investigations in the past which have identified rattlesnake pills as a source of human salmonella and lastly real quickly um, there's been a study in PLOS One about rat lungworm disease and they did a study in Hawaii and they found that in this particular part of Hawaii Island 94% of the rats were positive for 
the rat lungworm parasite. So I encourage you to check that out at OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. And again, thank you for listening on this Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas, Michael. And I will see you next week on Outbreak News This Week. Good night. God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.